Now's your opportunity to leave. I know, so either. Our crazy pastor is actually inviting people to leave even before the message. Yeah. Here's why. As really with every Sunday and Wednesday we teach the word here, we're going to talk about things that we are responsible for. So if you leave now and you don't hear it, then you're not responsible for it. But if you stay, then just like we said last week, when you and I stand before the Lord one day and have to give an account of our Christian life, these are some of the things we're going to have to give an account for. We're going to be responsible for it because we've now heard what the Word of God says on the matter. Well, if you'd like to stay and follow along this morning, I want you to turn with me, first of all, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and Hebrews chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and Hebrews chapter 10. Let me read these couple of verses, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 12. The verse I want us to look at this morning is verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, Now you are Christ's body, and each of you, that means us, each of us that are Christians, we are now a member of Christ's body. We are part of the whole of Christ's body. The body of Christ. Then if you go back to Romans chapter 12 and verse 5. Romans chapter 12 and verse 5. So we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually we are members who belong to one another. Now you can turn to Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 19. One of the questions that I'm asked a lot about in this day and age, especially when new folks come to the church, but even for some who've been here for a while, is like, Pastor, what do I have to do to be a member of the Oasis Church? And I basically tell people, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yeah. You, you have the Holy Spirit living within you? Yeah. Then guess what? You're a member. Because why should we as a church, why should I as a pastor require more of you to be a member of our local church than God requires to be a member of the body of Christ. That's why I tell me we don't have classes here. You don't have to jump through all these hoops to be a member. But here is something that you and I need to realize. That if I am a Christian, now again, I'm talking to Christians here, so if you never accepted Christ as your Savior, you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you, then none of this applies to you this morning. You can go, oh, good, good, I can stay and not be responsible. Well, to a degree. But what we do want to point out is this, that the Bible clearly teaches that if I am a Christian, then I am to be a responsible member of the body of Christ. And that in this context, whether you're talking about Romans or 1 Corinthians or even in Hebrews, he's not talking to every Christian in the world. Go, well, I know I'm a member of the body of Christ. All of us as Christians all over the world. No, he's talking to local churches. And he's saying to us today, you and I have a responsibility to one another as members of the body of Christ expressed locally in local churches. So often again today we live in a culture even in the world and even amongst many Christians 
where we want the privileges of being part of something, but don't talk to me about the responsibility. And God is all about the balance. He's saying to us, look, there's great privileges that you and I get by being a member of the body of Christ. But there's also things because now we are part of something bigger and greater than us. We are part of the whole. We have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now how this fits into the context of Hebrews, remember is, many of these Christians in the first century, these first century Jews who had embraced Christ, were ready to give up on their Christian life, give up on God, sort of throw in the towel and say, I'm done, I'm done following Christ, that's it. And one of the reasons then why he's going to talk to us today about our responsibility as Christians in the body of Christ, especially in our local churches like the one he's speaking to here in Hebrews, is he's saying, well, one of the reasons why you're in such a bad place is because you have not taken your responsibility seriously enough as a member of the body of Christ. You're all about the privileges, but... You need to focus on the responsibility because he's going to tell us that it's actually through being a responsible member of the body of Christ. Again, expressed locally in local churches all throughout the world, that that's how we get spiritually healthy. That's how we get spiritually strong. That's how we get to the place where we won't get discouraged and filled with despair and feel like giving up and feeling like the world is overwhelming us and all of that. Because that's how God designed it. God said, here's my plan. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So listen to the words then of the author of Hebrews, beginning in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, the Greek word literally means those born from the same womb. Because all born-again Christians have to be born the same way. We are born into the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice of Christ. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and then we are all baptized into one body through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the fresh and living way that he inaugurated for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and the assurance that faith brings, because we have had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. And let us hold unwaveringly to the hope that we confess, for the one who made the promise is trustworthy, and let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. There are four responsibilities in those verses we just read this morning. As members of the body of Christ, here are the four things that you and I, as members of his body, should be doing with one another. Because you'll notice throughout this passage, let us, let us, let us. He's not talking to us now as individual Christians. He's saying God has called us out as his church, the ecclesia, that's what the word means. The called out assembly. And he calls us to gather or assemble together. And God says, even though I am omnipresent, I am all places at all times, because that's who I am as God, yet I, I move in a certain way, I dwell within a certain way, when my people come together as my people. Which is why Jesus could say, even where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be there. I'll be there. In other words, he's, he's basically sanctioning and encouraging us getting together and not being these isolated islands that many Christians are today. Because he says, you and I are accountable. And one day when we stand before Jesus Christ, one of the things we're going to be accountable for is this. What kind of member of the church were we? 
Well, I wasn't a member. And God could say, oh yeah, you were. If you're standing before me through the blood of Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit, then you should have recognized you were already a member. You might not went through classes or anything like that, but you were a member of my body. And therefore, it was your responsibility not only to be a member of my body at large, but to be a member of my body within a local church context. Because as we just read, how can we fulfill the commands that God gives us in verses 19 through 25 of Hebrews 10 if we're not assembling and gathering together on a regular basis locally? I can't do this with somebody who's a Christian in China right now, but I can do it with somebody who's a Christian in Chandler or Gilbert right now. And the four things are this, and I'll give them to you for those of you that like to take notes or have an outline or something, then we're going to go back and talk about each one this morning. First, we should be enjoying the presence of God, verse 22. We should be embracing the promises of God, verse 23. We should be exerting influence upon the people of God, verse 24. And we should be engrossed in the priorities of God, verse 25. I'll repeat those again, but let's go back, first of all, to the first one. What should I be doing? What, what should we be doing as the people of God? We should be enjoying the presence of God. Notice what he says in verse 22. Let us draw near. Remember, he's just told us in these last couple of chapters how God, in a sense, was so unaccessible in the Old Testament system. And we talked about the limitations of the Old Testament system. And now he says, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through what he talks about there in verses 19 and 20, that we now have confidence to enter the very presence of God, not on our own merit, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus inaugurated for us a fresh and living way that we can come through the curtain, which is his own flesh, and we can come right into the presence of God. And he's saying, we need to, when we come together, make it a priority to enjoy the presence of God that is now our privilege through the blood that Jesus has spilled for us. That's what local church should be about. So many Christians say, well, why, why do we go to church? And what? Well, first of all, we should be coming together to draw near to God. All of us. Let us draw near. And we do that through prayer. We do that through praise. We do that through preaching the word. I mean, how many times as a Christian throughout your Christian life have you even been in the presence of somebody, say, who's praying? And you go, it's like, I, I feel like I'm in God's presence when they pray. Or when you've been in the, and in, in, in you heard a message, some, some preacher preach, and you go, I, I feel like I'm being transported right to God. Or you sing a song, and, and the song, and, and that Pray time just simply, again, transports you right into the presence of God. That's the way the corporate body of Christ is supposed to be. We should feel like we are pressing in to the very presence of God every time we're together. And that should be the priority of even why we get up and come. Is Yes, can I be in the presence of God on my own? Yes, but there's something special, God says, when my people come together and we all corporately want to come into His presence. God says, I'll work. I will move. I will establish myself there. And I will manifest my presence to you in a special way. I will bless you because you want to draw. And James even says, when we want to draw near to God, God will draw near to us. If I was to have asked at the beginning of the message this morning, how many of us want to go to heaven? I'm hoping that every hand would go up, right? Yet what if I also said, how many of us want to go to heaven today? Some people would be like, well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know. And yet, what he's saying to us is, because of, again, what Jesus did, you and I in the New Testament age really can go to heaven anytime we want. We can enter the very presence of God. And God wants to see his people do this as we come together. This is what we are responsible for. Not being entertained, 
Again, so many churches today are about putting people on stage that can entertain all the people sitting out there. That's not what we're about, either through our worship or through the ministry of the Word. It's not about entertaining you. It's about all of us coming together saying, we want to go into the presence of God. We want to experience your presence, God. We want to be near to you. We want to feel you. We want to touch you. That's what he's saying is our responsibility when we come together. And it's all about the heart. Notice he says, let's draw near with a sincere heart. It's not about being here for any other reason than that I want to get closer to God. That's the reason I come to church. That's the reason I wake up on Sunday morning when I can sleep in. Because I know that God will meet with me and my other fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in a special way. And I can experience the presence of God with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's why I want to come here. That's why I want to be a part of worship. That's why I want to hear the word. That's why I want to hear the prayers of God's people. That's why I want to fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Because I want to draw near to God with others. And he goes on to talk about the fact that we can have more assurance and confidence the closer we get to God. He says, in the assurance that this faith brings to us. He says, I'm struggling. I have so many doubts. I like confidence. I like assurance. God says, come on. Just like we say, draw, draw closer to me. And you'll have more confidence. You'll have more assurance in your life, the closer you get to me. Because we've had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Jesus Christ has taken care of everything and removed everything that was an obstacle between us coming near to God. And the author is saying, Jesus didn't just do this, you know, to feel good. In fact, most of what he went through, he didn't feel good physically, spiritually, or emotionally about it. He went through everything that he went through so that he could remove anything that was between us and God so that we could get as close to God as we want. And as I shared last week, I truly believe that we can get as near to God as we want to get. God will never say to any of us, or even as a church, as a body, if we truly, that's something that we, again, want to catch fire in, and we want to do, then God's going to say, keep coming, keep drawing closer. God never tells any individual or any church, now you've come too close to me. Again, not because we can get that close in our own or on our own, but through what Jesus did, Jesus opened up the way for us to get as close to God as we want to get. If you're not close to God this morning, if we as a church are not close to God, it's on us, not on God. God, through Jesus Christ, has made the way. Made the way. And we are responsible as members of the body of Jesus Christ to draw near. That should be why we're here. Not for this and that and all these other things that many Christians join a local church and are part of a local church for. It should be we are coming together to draw near to God. But that's not the only responsibility. The second one in verse 23 is we are also coming to embrace the promises of God. He says in verse 23, and let us Hold unwaveringly to the hope that we confess. A couple things. First of all, you'll notice the words hold unwaveringly. Keep secure. Hold fast to. Well, that implies that there's a fight about holding to our hope. And there is. The author is, hey, he's saying, look, there are many things in our earthly life that assaults our hope, that attacks our hope, to where we start to lose hope. He said, which is another reason why we are responsible to come together so that as we come together, we can sort of keep each other holding unwaveringly to the confident expectation that we have in God, which is what the word hope means. How do I do that? By embracing the promises of God. Notice what he goes on to say. Let us hold, hold unwaveringly to the hope that we confess. By the way, 
Confessing something means it's said out loud. You and I, if, if something's being confessed, that means you hear a confession, right? So that's another reason why he's saying, it's not enough just for us as believers to say, well, Lord, I, I confess my hope in you and I'm all by myself at home. That's good, but we have the responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ, part of the body, to come together and start expressing, if you will, our hope, our confident expectation in our God and share with each other the promises of God and encourage each other to embrace the promises of God. For he goes on to say, because the one who made the promise is trustworthy. Not that it totally falls out this way. But you can even sort of break it down and look at verse 22 and enjoying the presence of God as primarily as a local church coming together in our worship time where we praise the Lord through song and musical instruments and we come together and raise our voices together. Where in verse 23, embracing the promises of God could also be looked at as when the word of God and the promises of God are expounded and explained and they go forth as well. And we all say yes, amen to that. We embrace that. We are saying to each other that yes, we do believe these promises. And the reason we believe these promises and have hope in these promises is because of the character of the one who made the promise. God cannot lie, the Bible says. He is trustworthy. He is reliable. He is dependable. And every promise that God has made is going to happen just as God said. But it's not enough for us as Christians to, again, be these isolated islands and try to work through that in our own minds. What helps us and encourages us and supports us in our Christian life is when we press the flesh with our brothers and sisters in Christ and we hear them talk about the promises of God. And when we hear them have confidence in the promises of God and where they share the promises of God with us and when we can do the same thing with others. It sort of buoys our faith and our hope in God to hear other Christians and to be able to even look around even in an auditorium like this and go, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not the only one that buys into this God and the Bible and Jesus Christ and all this. There are actually other crazy people just like me. That's important. Especially in the world today where Christianity and faith in Christ and all of that is assaulted day in and day out. And where our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are part of the body of Christ, that we don't get to interact with while we're here on earth, and many other parts of the world are literally dying every day for their faith. And I know we won't hear about this in the media as well, but there is a great revival going on right now in China, if you haven't heard. There are many, many, many people coming to faith in Christ in China right now. God is doing a work. But God says, it's not enough for you just to embrace the promises of God. I want your embracing my promises to carry over to your brothers and sisters in Christ so that all in that church... Say, yes, amen, this is what we believe and why we believe it. And we are coming together as God's people acknowledging that. Because God, we are singing about your faithfulness. We are acknowledging you are reliable, you are dependable. We are, we are preaching about your character, God. And that all of your promises will come true just as you say. We are praying for one another and with one another on the promises that God gives us. That if we ask anything in His name, He will hear us. That's our responsibility. Which leads to verse 24. Exerting influence upon the people of God. And even though these first two responsibilities obviously imply that as well, here he really gets down to the nitty gritty and says, Guys, this is why God says it's not enough for you just to be a Christian on your own, but that as a member of the body of Christ, all of us then are responsible to find a local church where we can get plugged into and engaged with because it's not about us. 
It's about me being able to exert influence upon my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. First of all, he says in verse 24, let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good work. You know what the words take thought? It literally means to take time to consider. Now, as Christians, sometimes we take time to consider our brothers and sisters in Christ, usually to be critical of them. Or to find some fault or thing that we don't like about them. But the author of Hebrews said, we should be taking time to consider on a regular basis, how can I inspire my brother or sister? How can I motivate my brother or sister? How can I even support my brother and sister in their walk with the Lord? And again, how can we carry this out if we're not ever getting together? If we're just all staying to our homes and staying to ourselves, then this cannot be actualized. And as I said, I believe that one day every one of us who are members in the body of Christ are going to have to stand before Jesus, our Lord, and we're going to have to give an account. Why were we not engaged in a local church? Why did we not exert our influence to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Why did we not take any thought at all of how we could support them or inspire them or motivate them in their walk with God? And then in verse 25, he sort of takes us a step further. He says, well, first of all, it can't be because we're unfaithful to the house of God because that means that then we're not going to have those opportunities. We've got to be faithful to God's house. Which, by the way, is what he calls us also in verse 21. Jesus Christ is a priest over the house of God. He says, so don't abandon. By the way, this word is a military word in the Greek language. It literally was about soldiers who deserted or forsake, for, uh, forsook their fellow soldiers on the battle. That's a strong word. He says, you realize when you're not faithful to your brothers and sisters in Christ in your local church, God looks at you as a deserter, a spiritual deserter. You are turning your back on your brothers and sisters in Christ because you are preventing them from you being a positive influence in their walk with God. They can't benefit from what you could bring. And he says, God looks at that as spiritual abandonment. And then he goes on to say, some are in the habit of doing this. See, even back then, sometimes I think we get this romantic thing that the early church, now Book of Acts, that's a whole other subject, but the early church was, man, it was filled with on fire people, and then all the early churches in the first couple centuries, man, they were all just on fire for God. And then, no. This, this was probably written, well, it was written before 70 A.D. because the temple had not been destroyed yet. So you're talking maybe 25 or 30 years since Jesus ascended back to heaven, and yet he's saying even then, as early as it was since Jesus was on earth, people were part of a local church, but really not engaged. They got in the habit of not coming to church. And that's really what it is. Because you and I can get in the habit of coming to church or we can get in the habit of not coming to church. And it's real easy to get in the habit of not coming. And so many Christians today, 52 Sundays a year, that's it. That's all we have an opportunity for. And so many miss so many opportunities, not just for themselves, to again be in the presence where they can draw near with their brothers and sisters in Christ into the presence of God and where they can hear the promises of God and where they can pray with others and be encouraged. But they miss the opportunity to do anything for others as well. You and I have to build some good habits into our life. That's what the spiritual disciplines of our Christian life is all about. And it really is about being disciplined. So many Christians today live undisciplined lives. We read our Bible every couple weeks. 
We pray whenever there's a crisis that comes in, but otherwise we really don't have a regular prayer. Church, well, I go whenever everything else just sort of, I, I don't have anything else to do on Sunday morning. Then, then I'll go. And God says, no. Look at all that Jesus went through, leaving the glories of heaven, taking on humanity, suffering on the cross, all of that to bring us in to be part of his body. He says, guys, there are so many responses, or so many privileges in being part of the body of Jesus Christ, but there's also responsibility here as well. And we've got to start building some disciplines and good spiritual habits into our life. Because if we don't, we will get to the same place that these folks did in Hebrew. We'll, life will become bigger than us. We will get discouraged. We will feel like quitting. We will be in a spiritually weakened and unhealthy state. And we will wonder even, why did I get there? Pretty easy. If we don't have regular prayer times and regular Bible times and regular fellowship with other Christians, it's going to get hard real quick. Which leads to the last, engrossed in the priorities of God. After all he said in verses 19 through 25, he then ends this passage with this. And encouraging each other, which simply means standing by or standing with one another to strengthen one another, and even more so because you see the day drawing the phrase, even more so in the Greek language, is trying to get us to realize that requires prioritizing. I can't do something even more than I am now if I don't start resetting my priorities. So the whole phrase in the original language speaks about, Christian, let's not forget what our priorities should be. And let's start reprioritizing things even more so. And then he gives us the motivation because we see the day approaching, literally coming faster and faster and faster. What's he talking about here? What's the day? I think in the context of last week and this week, he's talking about the day you and I stand before Jesus. The day we leave earthly existence and we enter into eternal existence. Because the Bible clearly teaches that the reality of eternity has been hardwired by God into every human being. God has set eternity into our hearts. If people today don't believe in eternity, it's because they are suppressing the truth of God or denying the truth of God. But God says, I created every human being with the understanding that they will live forever. And that this life, this earthly life, is really short. Eternity is forever. And therefore, this earthly life and investing in earthly things and temporal things should not be the priorities of our life. If we truly believe in eternity that God has promised us, then that should be where we invest ourselves. Is an eternal thing. And the author of Hebrews is saying, even 2,000 years ago, don't you see how quickly eternity is coming for you? It's coming, folks. You and I are going to be in eternity like that. Our earthly life that James says is like a vapor is going to be over. And by the way, not just maybe going through the whole process of living a long life and dying, but I really believe we are living in the last days and at the return of Jesus and us being in his presence and now transferring from this earthly life to that eternal life could come real quickly for all of us. And so he's saying, because eternity is fast approaching, shouldn't we be engrossed in the priorities of God? Shouldn't we begin to value the things that God values and lay aside the things that we're living for that God says is really not worth it? 
Again, 10,000 years from now, a million years from now, 10 million years from now, we're not going to care that we were involved with that or spent our money on that or did that or was engaged with that. But 10 million years from now and 100 million years from now, we'll be glad we were a part of a church like the Oasis and that we invested ourselves in eternal things. Let me give you one other sort of thought on this, and obviously I'm preparing already for my seminar in the book of Revelation coming in September, but let me share with you something really interesting that maybe a lot of folks don't know. In the book of Revelation, the author, John, uses the word and, which is the Greek word chi, 1,200 times. I'm not exaggerating. 12, if you want to go home and count the hands in the book of Revelation, you go ahead. 1,200 uses of the word chi in the book of Revelation. Why? Why does he do that? Because he's trying to paint for us this picture that things are moving very rapidly towards their conclusion. That's why he said, and this, and then this, and then this, and this, and this, and this. He wants us to read the book of Revelation all in one sitting and to see laid out for us how in the history of God's plan, things are just coming at such a rapid pace and how God is laying all things out and that things are coming to a culmination real quickly. And the reason he wants us to do that is because he wants us to live prepared for that day. You see, prophecy was not given to us by God to scare us but to prepare us as God's people for eternity. And that's exactly what the author of Hebrews said. Even more so because you see eternity fast approaching. These are the responsibilities that we have as members of the body of Christ. And shall I say, members of the Oasis Church. Maybe you say, well, I'm not a member. That's fine. Then all I got to say is, you need to be, you need to be a member somewhere. Because God will hold all of us as Christians responsible to be an engaged member of a local church because we're already a member of the body of Christ through the blood of Christ. And because of that, we have responsibilities, not just towards ourselves, but toward each other. Let us. Enjoy the presence of God. Let us embrace the promises of God. Let us exert influence upon the people of God. And let us be engrossed in the pride of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us enough to lay it all out there for us. And to show us not just what our great privileges are as the people of God, but what are our responsibilities as the people of God. Not just towards you and not just towards ourselves, but towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Those that we come together with on a regular basis, it's our habit. So that we can come into your presence together. So that we can embrace your promises together. So that we can exert influence upon each other and inspire and motivate and support one another together. So that we can be engrossed in the priorities that are yours together. It's about us doing this together, hand in hand, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. That's the way God designed the body of Christ to be. And so I pray today, God, that you would use this message to inspire us, to motivate us, to step up in these last days as we see eternity fast approaching us, and that we would be willing to be a faithful member of the body of Christ. A faithful member of the Oasis Church or whatever church I am a member of. It has nothing to do with taking classes, getting the approval of church leadership. If you're a member of the body of Christ through the blood of Christ, then you and I are already responsible towards one another. God, help us to live with 
eternity in you. These things we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to date myself. Back in the 70s, there was a secular pop group called Fleetwood Mac. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. One of their hits was, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Actually, that is pretty biblical. That phrase, not the song. That's what God wants us to do. We are so obsessed with what time it is now, and God says, my people should be more obsessed and focused on what time is coming. The day is fast approaching. And some of you, as we stand here in just a moment and we sing this final song, may go, why did you choose lead me to the cross? Because I believe that in order for us to be who we should be and need to be for one another, we need to follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who laid down his life on the cross for us. And Jesus says, greater love has no man than this, that a man or a woman would lay down their life for their friends. How are we going to be willing to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters in Christ unless we are willing, like Jesus, to go to the cross and die to self and be willing to sacrifice the rest of our earthly lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the only way. And when we are willing to take up our own cross and die to self. So would you stand with me this morning? And let's sing this song as a song of declaration from our hearts to our Lord today. Lord, lead me to that cross where I can die to self, where I am willing to sacrifice and lay down my life for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Give me a heart for others, God. Give me a love for my brothers and sisters like I never had before. Give me such a passion for my brothers and sisters in Christ and their walk with God that you can't keep me from coming together with them. That you can't keep me from praying for them. That you can't keep me from somehow encouraging them. Because I know that anything that I do like that, God, that's touching to eternity. That's investing in eternity. Because we're all going to live forever. God has placed that fact within each of our hearts. Let's sing this song this morning. Again, as a declaration to our Lord this morning.